Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn, Alice Bryant, and Pete Musto. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Brian Lynn. The United States Army has developed a new physical fitness test that aims to prepare soldiers for real-life combat situations. The Army's current physical fitness test covers three main activities, sit-ups, push-ups, and a 3.2-kilometer run. It has to be completed in two hours. The new test will include six events to complete in 50 minutes. The exam adds more difficult and complex exercises, including a strength deadlift, standing power throw, and drag and carry. The new test comes after many Army commanders expressed concerns in recent years that new soldiers are not physically fit. A public opinion study last year looked into the situation. It found almost half of commanders questioned said that newly arriving soldiers could not meet the physical demands of combat. Army officials have also said about 12% of soldiers at any one time cannot deploy to combat areas because of injuries. General Stephen Townsend is head of U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command. He told the Associated Press that many top officials have long thought that the existing fitness test does not effectively measure the physical qualities needed for battle. Townsend said the new test may be harder, but it is necessary. For many, meeting the new fitness levels will be difficult. The old test rated soldiers differently based on their age and gender. The new one will be far more physically demanding and will not consider age or sex. Townsend said the new test was designed based on scientific research that attempts to link exercises to actual combat activities. Such things could include running away from fire, carrying a wounded soldier, or carrying heavy equipment. I'm Brian Lynn. In March, United States officials will move forward with plans to sell leases for oil and gas exploration in two states, New Mexico and Oklahoma. The leases include land near the Chaco Culture National Historical Park and other areas that Native American tribes consider holy. 
The sale comes against the wishes of tribal leaders, environmentalists, and Democratic Party lawmakers. All three groups have criticized the U.S. Bureau of Land Management for pushing ahead with drilling permit inspections and preparations for energy leases. The Bureau had few people working when the federal government was partially closed for five weeks in December and January. Critics have said that they were barred from the process because the government failed to release any information about the sale. Critics also questioned if the Bureau would be able to effectively examine the land available for leasing and whether it would consider objections to the plans. Tom Udall is a U.S. Senator and Democrat from New Mexico. He told the Associated Press in an email that he is concerned about the latest attempt to lease culturally important land without a more complete plan. Udall said it was a mistake for the agency to move forward with such an unclear process since critical government services were closed for 35 days. An agency representative said officials decided to delay the sale by a few weeks to provide time for a public protest period that was delayed during the government shutdown. It confirmed on its website that it would take comments starting February 11th and that the sale was set for March 28th. The battle over energy development around Chaco has been around for years. Chaco is bordered by the Navajo Nation and a number of state and federal lands. In 2015, government officials visited the area in hopes of making an agreement between the tribes and energy companies. The Bureau of Land Management and the Bureau of Indian Affairs began working together to improve the resource management plan for the San Juan Basin. It covers a large part of northwestern New Mexico and parts of southern Colorado. The partnership aimed to ensure tribes would be part of the decision-making and that scientific and archaeological studies would be done to ensure cultural sensitivity. The nine pieces of land are on the outer edge of the informal barrier area near the park. Critics have warned that park visitors might see drilling equipment in some places if those areas were leased. Whether the sound of the equipment could be heard would depend on wind direction. There are also concerns about light pollution affecting Chaco's night sky. Paul Reed is with Archaeology Southwest, a research group. He said many communities within the 16-kilometer area need a greater level of protection. I'm Alice Bryant. Earth's North Magnetic Pole is moving, researchers say. It has moved so much so quickly that a group of scientists hurried to change a model that helps guide ships, airplanes, and submarines in the Arctic Ocean.
Last week, the scientists released new information on the North Magnetic Pole sooner than they had planned. Compass needles point toward the pole. As a child, you might have received a simple compass as a gift. It has a magnetized pointer which shows the direction of magnetic north. Liquid metal at the center of our planet produces the magnetic field. Unpredictable movements in the liquid mean the field and the location of magnetic north are always changing. The World Magnetic Model records those changes. The model is a joint product of the British Geological Survey and the United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The two agencies were planning to report changes in the magnetic North Pole, as they do every five years, at the end of 2019. But the pole has moved so quickly they had to release the information much sooner. Scientists have found that the magnetic North Pole is moving at a speed of about 55 kilometers every year. 100 years ago, the pole was located near the coast of northern Canada. It crossed the International Date Line, the imaginary line running through the Pacific Ocean from the North Pole to the South Pole, in 2017. Now the magnetic North Pole is in the middle of the Arctic Ocean and moving toward Russia. Arno Shulia is a scientist at the University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado. He is also the lead researcher for the newly updated World Magnetic Model. Shulia told the Associated Press the continuous movement of magnetic north is a problem for compasses in smartphones and other electronic devices. Airplanes and boats mainly use Global Positioning System, or GPS, instruments for navigation. GPS is not affected by the movements of the pole because it is satellite-based. But airplanes and boats do depend on magnetic north in emergencies, Shulia noted. The U.S. military needs to know the location of magnetic north for navigation and parachute drops. The American Space Agency, NASA, the Federal Aviation Administration, and the U.S. Forest Service also use it. Names for some airport landing areas are based on their direction toward magnetic north, and the names change when the pole moves. For example, an airport in Fairbanks, Alaska, renamed landing area 1L-19R to 2L-20R in 2009. The fact that the pole is going fast makes this region more prone to large errors, Shulia told Nature magazine. Kieran Began is with the British Geological Survey. He told the Reuters news agency the magnetic North Pole didn't move much between 1900 and 1980, but it's really accelerated in the past 40 years. Since 1831, when the pole was first measured in the Canadian Arctic, it has moved about 2,300 kilometers toward Siberia. The speed of its movement has increased from about 15 kilometers a year to 55 kilometers per year since 2000. The reason is movements in Earth's liquid outer core, said University of Maryland geophysicist Daniel Lathrop. He was not part of the research team. There is a hot liquid ocean of iron and nickel in the planet's core, where the movement produces an electric field. Lathrop said the changes in movement of the liquid are similar to changes in the weather. 
Earth's magnetic south pole is moving far slower than the north. In general, Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker, leading scientists to say that it will eventually cause the north and south poles to change positions. Such a change has happened several times before, but not in the last 780,000 years. It's not a question of if it's going to reverse, the question is when it's going to reverse, Lathrop said. The reversal will take 1,000 years or more to come into effect, experts said. But Lathrop sees a reversal coming sooner, not later, because of the weakened magnetic field. An area over the South Atlantic has already reversed beneath Earth's surface. That could cause problems for birds that use magnetic fields to navigate. And a general weakening of the magnetic field is not good for people, especially astronauts. The magnetic field protects Earth from dangerous radiation, Lathrop noted. Kieran Began said the recent movements of the North Magnetic Pole would be unnoticed by most people outside the Arctic. Navigation systems in cars or phones depend on radio waves from satellites high above the Earth to identify their position on the ground. It wouldn't really affect anyone driving a car, Began added. I'm Pete Musto. And I'm Ana Mateo. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. The American Civil War in the 1860s was fought not only on land, there was a great deal of fighting between the Union and Confederate navies. This part of the war, the Sea War, is often forgotten, but it was important. The Union victory might not have been possible without the successes of its navy. Many battles took place just off the coast of the United States. Many others took place farther away in international waters. Kay Gallant and Harry Monroe talk about the naval side of the Civil War. As soon as the war started, President Abraham Lincoln wanted to block the South's major ports he wanted to prevent the South from shipping its agricultural products to other countries in exchange for industrial goods. Lincoln's plan was good, but it had one major weakness. The Union Navy was too small for the job. The Confederate seacoast was long. It extended from Chesapeake Bay to Mexico a distance of 5,600 kilometers. There were not enough ships in the Union Navy to blockade all of it. Many months would pass before the Union could build up an effective naval force. The Confederacy had no Navy at the start of the Civil War. The Confederate government had little money to create one, and the South had no factories to build one. For a while, the Confederacy was able to get warships from Britain. Then the Union put diplomatic pressure on Britain to stop this support. For the most part, the Confederacy depended on privately owned ships, to get goods in and out of the South. About 20 of these private ships flew the Confederate flag. Most were very successful in the beginning. The Florida, for example, 
captured more than 30 ships before being captured itself off the coast of Brazil in 1864. The Alabama captured more than 60 ships. It was finally sunk in a battle with the Kearsarge off the coast of France. The Shenandoah sailed in the Pacific Ocean. It captured 40 ships. After the war ended, the Shenandoah tied up in Liverpool, England. In addition to these victories, the Confederacy claimed responsibility for several new naval technologies during the Civil War. One was the first modern submarine. This ship was 10 meters long. It sank four times while being tested. It was raised each time and put back into service. One night, it fired its torpedoes at a much larger Union ship and sank it. But the explosion was so great that it tore apart the submarine, and it sank too. The Confederacy also developed very effective underwater explosive devices for use in the harbors. Even with its victories and technologies, however, the Confederacy could not stop the Union Navy. The Union Navy was bigger to begin with and grew much faster. During the first two years of the Civil War, the Union captured several southern ports, Fort Hatteras and Roanoke Island, North Carolina, Port Royal, South Carolina, Pensacola, Florida, and perhaps most importantly, New Orleans, Louisiana. New Orleans lay near the mouth of the Mississippi River. It was the largest city in the South. It was the largest seaport. It had become a busy industrial center, producing war equipment for Confederate forces. If the Union could capture New Orleans, it would control the Mississippi River. President Lincoln appointed Navy officer David Farragut to lead the attack on New Orleans. To reach the city, Farragut had to sail his ships past two Confederate forts on the Mississippi River. He shelled the forts for six days and nights, but the forts were so strong that the shells caused little damage. He decided not to wait any longer. One dark night, Farragut led 17 Union warships up the river in a line. The Confederate forces heard them and began to fire. One ship was sunk. Three others were damaged so badly that they could not continue. But 13 made it safely past the forts. When Farragut reached New Orleans, he found the city defenseless. Several thousand Confederate soldiers had fled. They knew they could not defend against the bigger Union force. Only civilians remained. Farragut captured New Orleans without a fight. The Confederate flag was lowered, and the United States flag was raised over the city. Several weeks before Farragut captured New Orleans, a new kind of Navy battle was fought off Hampton Roads, Virginia. It was the first battle between iron ships. On the Confederate side was the Virginia. It had been built from what remained of a captured Union warship called the Merrimack. The Virginia was like no other warship ever seen in the world. It was 80 meters long. The part that showed above the water line was built of wood 60 centimeters thick. This part was covered with sheets of iron 10 centimeters thick. 
Ten windows were cut into it. Behind each window was a cannon. In a battle, the windows would open, the cannons would fire, and the windows would close again. At the front was a sharp point of iron that could smash through the sides of wooden ships. The Virginia could not move fast, and it was difficult to control. It took almost thirty minutes to turn around. Still, there seemed to be no way to stop this iron monster. It already had destroyed two Union warships, and it was coming back for more. The Union ship chosen to fight the Virginia was the Monitor. It, too, was covered with iron, but it was much smaller than the Virginia, and it carried only two cannons. These two cannons, however, were on a part of the ship that could turn in a complete circle. They could be aimed in any direction. The Monitor and the Virginia faced each other on the morning of March 9th, 1862. They moved in close, very close, then began to fire. A Confederate cannonball hit the iron side of the monitor and bounced away. Union sailors cheered. The cannons of the Virginia could do no damage. But the Union sailors soon discovered that their cannons could do no damage either. The men inside the two ships suffered from noise, heat, and smoke. The roar of their own cannons was extremely loud. Even louder was the crash of enemy cannonballs and explosive shells on the iron walls. Some of the men suffered burst eardrums. At least one man was struck unconscious from the force of a cannonball against the iron. The men quickly learned to stay away from the walls. Smoke from the cannons filled the ships. Then it floated out over the water. At times the two ships could not see each other. The Virginia and the Monitor fought for three hours. Neither ship scored an important hit. Neither suffered serious damage. Then the cannons of the Virginia fell silent. The Confederate ship had used up its gunpowder. It also had used up much of its fuel. It was lighter now and was floating higher in the water. A well-aimed cannonball could hit below its iron covering and sink it. The Confederate captain decided to withdraw. The Union captain, too, was ready to break off the battle. He decided not to follow. Neither ship could claim victory. But the Monitor had kept the Virginia from destroying more of the Union's wooden warships. The Virginia itself was to live just two more months. Union forces seized the Confederate Navy base at Norfolk, where the Virginia was kept, and the Iron Monster was sunk to keep it from falling into Union hands. The battle at Hampton Roads between the Virginia and the Monitor was undecisive. It did not have much effect on the final result of America's Civil War. But it was still an important battle, for it marked the beginning of the end of the world's wooden navies. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.